All right. So I guess we have both screens working. This is still the most awkward classroom I've ever taught in, so I apologize. It feels so spread out and just weird. I'll do my best to fill my, uh, my voice in the classroom so you can hear me. But um, I've just handed out homework, too. Did everybody get a copy of that? OK. Uh, if you happen to misplace it, I've also uploaded the PDF of it online. You can get it from MU Online. Uh, as you can see here on the announcement slide, it's due on Wednesday, the 31st of August, so that's a week from today. Uh, this is maybe one of the easier assignments of the semester, not quite as easy as the first one, which most of you have already completed. Uh, homework one, by the way, is due by 5 o'clock today. Just as a reminder, that's going to be available on MU Online until 5. Uh, so after homework one is homework two, uh, that's due at the beginning of class, and so here's how we're going to do it. Just set the uh, completed assignment on the table here as you come in. Since class starts at 12, that means if you arrive at 12.05, then the homework assignment's not accepted. So I know that's really harsh, but that's just sort of uh, the way we're going to do things to encourage everyone to be on time and so we can get started quickly. I don't bring a stapler to class, and so you're going to have to staple your papers together before you come. Um, so any questions about homework two? There are some special instructions in italics on the paper itself where I say that I'd uh, encourage you to use engineering paper or, you know, if you don't want to use engineering paper, then you can just use ordinary, like, copy paper that's unlined. And the reason why I ask that you use unlined paper is we're going to be doing a lot of diagrams and sketches through the semester, and it's just easier to do those on an unlined piece of paper than ordinary notebook paper. Uh, it's even easier with engineering paper if you've got it available, but uh, notebook paper, especially the kind with the shredded little bits on the edge, oh, that's the worst. So don't do that to me, all right? I just sort of lose my mind when I see that. All right. I don't know why, but today we're talking about interest rates and rates of return, and we're going to do an in-class exercise uh, related to interest rates. I just want to make sure this is recording. Yep, all right. So as I've mentioned before, I'm going to be recording the classes, and this will be especially helpful on the days where um, we're working on Excel. And you don't need to bring your computer to class each day. I'll try to remember to either announce it in class beforehand, or if I forget to do that, I'll send out a, an email to everyone saying, you know, tomorrow's an Excel day. Bring your laptop if you can. Uh, so. These recordings are helpful when we do Excel stuff because there's a wide range of Excel familiarity is my past experience. Some majors use it a lot more than others. So um, any questions before we move into the new material? On your homework one, I've already started reading through those and I add comments as I read it. Um, you know, the, the irony of using MU Online is I can only see what the instructor view looks like. So I don't have any idea what my comments look like to you or where you go to get them. I just know where I type them. So hopefully you're able to see your grades and the feedback that I give you. And if you're not, then come see me and we'll maybe figure it out together. I'll finally get to see what the student view looks like. All right. Well, let's talk about interest. Um, maybe some of you already have student loans and are starting to uh, get your first exposure to the borrowing and loaning of money. But um, there's a difference in terminology that we're going to try and keep straight this semester. And um, that difference is the idea of a rate of return versus an interest rate. And as the book describes it, if you are from the perspective of a borrower, so if you're taking money from a bank or an institution, and then you have to pay them back that money plus a little more, then that little more that you have to pay is dictated by an interest rate. Um, by contrast, if you have the perspective of the person who's doing the loaning of the money, then you would call that the rate of return. So you can think of it as the profit that you're receiving. The irony is that the formula is the same in both cases. Um, it's just that uh, we want to keep straight who's giving the money out and who's receiving the money. And when we do cash flow diagrams, which is these sketches of when the money comes in, when the money goes out, 
then that's going to be especially important for us to um, be careful about the idea of perspective. Because in most problems, it's describing a transaction and the problem is a mirror image depending on whose perspective you take. The person who's loaning the money originally or the person who's receiving the money to begin with. So according to our textbook, the definition of interest is it's the manifestation of the time value of money. And if there is any one single phrase that is going to be repeated more than anything else this semester, it's this. It's the time value of money. So let me bold that just to emphasize how important it is. Now, by the way, it was just this morning that I finally got around to uh, putting all four of those different uh, notes files online. So I see lots of people taking hand notes today, and that's probably because you didn't have a chance to print them out yet. They're available online now. The PDFs are there if you want to print them out and have them available. Okay, so interest is a manifestation of the time value of money. That means the time value that money now is more valuable than money in the future. So think of it, if I could offer you a dollar now or a dollar in five years, why would it be better to take the dollar now? Besides just immediate gratification. Is there like an economic reason why it's better to have a dollar now instead of money some years in the future? I heard someone say inflation, and what did you say? It will increase over time. What will increase over time? Well, I'm going to give you the same dollar now or in the future, but something's changing over time. When you said, I, who said inflation? So what's inflating? Okay. It's ironic. It's actually the opposite. Most people think of inflation as the worth of the dollar is growing over time, but the, the reality is it's the cost that's inflating, what you're going to spend that dollar to buy. The prices are getting higher, and so actually the worth of money is getting lower over time. So um, if you went through a, a time machine back to the 50s and you had $10, you could you know, like buy a pretty big meal. Now you can do all right with $10, but you know, you're not going to go to a great restaurant for, t for $10. It's just money back then was more valuable than the same increment of money now. So this time value of money takes into consideration a lot of factors, and one of them is that prices are inflating, and therefore the value of any single dollar is decreasing over time. So that's why it's better to have your money as soon as you can get it, is because in general, in an inflationary society, which is most of the time, that means that prices keep going up. And so the bank looks at it this way. If they gave you $10,000 now, they have to get more than that back because the money you're going to be paying them with is less valuable. You know, we said that the money in five years isn't as valuable as today's dollars. And so they want a little extra to take that into account. They also want a little extra for their profits and for all the loan origination expenses, uh, document checks, and so on. But at the heart of it is the fact that future money isn't as valuable as money today. And so another way of looking at interest is just when you do the calculations, it's the difference between the beginning amount and the end amount of money. How much you received versus how much you paid back. And if you've ever had a credit card before, uh, you can really pay back a lot more than you ever took in the loan because credit cards are kind of notorious for having extraordinarily high interest rates. And that's an easy way to get into trouble. We'll look at some of those interest rates a little bit later today. So interest is an amount. It's the difference between the amount that you owe at a certain time and the principal. The principal being the original loan value. So when you take a loan from a bank, the principal is how much they gave you to buy a house or to pay for your education. The interest is the difference between that original amount and how much you owe at a given time as time increases how much you owe them. And so the rate is when you express that amount as a function of time. A rate is most commonly expressed as a percentage per year. And um, the way that we can get that formula, the interest rate per year, is you start with the interest accrued per time unit, 
which would be, um, you know, typically the interest rates that we're seeing for a savings account are less than 1% these days. So if you put $100 into the bank, that means over a one-year time period, they'll pay you one extra dollar for the privilege of holding your money and using it on their own things during that year-long period. And so you turn it into a percentage by the amount that's accrued divided by the principal times 100. Now, like I said, the rate of return is the same idea, but just flipping the perspective. Same formula here. Interest accrued per time unit in the numerator. The original principal amount in the denominator. Multiply it by 100. Formula is the same. It's just we're calling it a different thing if we are the borrower or if we are the investor. And um, there's an old saying that people under, who understand interest and people who understand especially compound interest are the ones who loan money. And when you don't understand it, then you tend to be the ones who borrow money. That's not always true, but it kind of illustrates the point that when you see how debt can snowball because of compound interest, you tend to be pretty wary of debt and try and avoid it for everything except the most important uh, expenses. All right. So any questions so far on this definition of interest rate or rate of return? Let's talk about cash flow diagrams. We're going to do this a lot um, through the semester, but I want to introduce the, uh, the idea very early. Um, sometimes we'll have lengthy problem statements that will talk about the bank, the interest rate, how many years you have to pay the loan, what the amount of the payments are going to be, and sometimes the payments ch change over time. You'll have to owe, you'll have to pay back one amount during year one, a different amount during year two. So what would you expect would be the benefits of a graphical representation of who owes what and when compared to just having it as a, a word problem statement? Why is it good to draw it? Mm hmm Good. Yeah. So one of the advantages, you can see that there's just a straight line that's sketched here. And I don't want to give too much away yet because today in the in-class exercise I'm going to have you working on, I want you to try drawing a sketch just from scratch without ever having seen a cash flow diagram yet. And then in a future class, we're going to go over all the details of you know, the, the typical formatting, what direction represents what. But the advantage of having your, infor your financial information in a diagram like this is that people absorb information visually a lot easier in general than they do when it's in the text. And there are ways when you're writing language that you can actually obscure the important information. You know, banks and attorneys do this all the time. Anytime you start a new website, uh, you know, they say click to continue, and there's a whole page after page of things that you didn't read, but it's going to govern your use of a website or your rights when you open a bank account or whatever. Most of the time, that information is obscure and uh, hard to penetrate kind of on purpose because you're giving away your rights in order to use a service. Well, the cash flow diagram is a way of making sure that you understand a transaction and what your obligations are going to be. And so I think you'll see the benefit of cash flow diagrams when we really get into them a lot next week. So for today, what we're going to do in this in-class exercise is um, take a look at applying some of these simple calculations. As I was looking through your introductory assignment, you know, in uh, the homework one, a lot of students have already done it. There were several students who said that the way they can learn the best this semester is lots of examples in class. And that's something I've heard year after year. Students really like hands-on examples. You know, 50 minutes of lecture would just be too much. And so it's better to get some practice doing things. And that's the, uh, that's the approach I'm going to take. So in the, uh, the handout I've given you, it's two-sided. On the front side is four problems. On the back side is just one more problem, but it's got multiple parts. You can uh, talk to your classmates as you're working on it. You should bring a calculator to class every day of the semester. You're definitely going to need a calculator. If you don't happen to have one today, then you can use your uh, phone. I think most phones have calculators. Um, I'll be circulating around the classroom with the solution. So if you want to check your work, 
then I'll tell you if you're on the right track. If I see a mistake, we'll try and find where it is. And then towards the end of class period, when we're almost out of time, I'll put the solution up on the screen. And then that way, uh, the solution will be included in the video that's being recorded for today's class. So if you want to go back and look at it later, you can find out how your solution matches up with what I put on the screen. Even though this has your name on it, you don't need to turn it in. I think you should keep it with you. And you'll notice that uh, it's been punched. There's a three-hole punch on the paper. If you don't have a binder for this class, I'd suggest that you should buy one, because we're going to have a handout almost every single class. And it'll be really useful for you when you're studying for the exams, or getting ready for quizzes, or doing your assignments. To have all of these in-class exercises, it'll be like a great review resource as well. So I'd encourage you to get a three-ring binder so you can keep these all together. Uh, all right, so like I said, you can work on these together. It does not need to be quiet in here during the next few minutes. I may break in with uh, some additional information. But uh, I like collaboration and collaboration. All right, let's take a quick look at the solution to the first three, just so that we can all stay on the same page if there's some questions. OK, so the first one. You borrow $20,000 from a bank that charges 5%. What's the total amount that is owed after a year? So we say it's the total amount is going to be the principal plus the interest that's due. So you'll owe $20,000 plus 5% of $20,000. So the principal amount, the interest amount, add it together, it's $21,000. All right, that's the, uh, the final accumulated amount. Any questions from the, uh, the first one? Okay, we get progressively a little more tricky here. Okay, question two. What rate of return will you earn if you invest $20,000 in a company and after one year they pay you back, uh, did I say 20,000? I meant 200,000 if I said 20,000. 200,000, they pay you back 212,000. So let's define the terms. As a first step, it's always good, you know, if you're gonna be substituting into a formula, label the variables that you're going to be substituting into. So I've labeled here principal, interest, then I substitute into the rate of return formula. I did a little bit of uh, subtraction when I was finding that interest amount. Obviously, that is the uh, 212 that I know is including both the principal and the interest, because it's the total accumulative amount that I want to get paid back. And so the interest amount divided by the principal amount times 100, so that's 6% per year, since this is after one year. And that's the common time frame that we're going to be using for interest rates, is on an annual basis. So the amount expressed as a percentage on an annual basis. All right, so the first two I saw most people got without too much trouble. The third one's a little tricky for two reasons. First of all, we've got these weird currencies. I will sometimes do that through the semester just for fun. Um, this ISK is the Icelandic crown. That's the currency they use in Iceland. And then AED is uh, UAE dirhams. That's the currency that they use in Dubai. So we know that today, after a year of saving, there is uh, 55,123.45 crowns in Peter's savings account. So that includes the original amount that Peter deposited, plus whatever interest accumulated during that one year period. We know that the account was earning 3%. We want to find out how much was the value a year ago before the interest accumulated. And we want to know it in dirhams rather than Icelandic crowns. So what I did as a first step, this isn't the only way. There are a couple of correct paths for this solution. The first thing I did was I converted from uh, crowns into dirhams for today. Now you can see the exchange rate is in the denominator because I've got ISK in the numerator. ISK canceling those two out will put this AED from the denominator of the denominator back into the numerator. So it's just, it cancels out algebraically. That's another way to think of it, more logically maybe, is you have to pay 35 crowns for a dirham. So obviously you're going to have fewer dirhams than you have crowns. So if you're not quite sure whether to multiply or divide, just think about you know, which is worth more. A crown has more value than a dirham. No, no, other way around. You have to pay 35 crowns for a dirham. So today, it's worth 
63.79 in dirhams. And then I say that a year ago, is that, that's the amount we're trying to find. We don't know yet. But we know that the total amount today includes both the initial amount, which is our principal, and then the interest. This whole term together, the second term after the plus sign, that is the interest that was paid. And the interest is a function of the initial principal amount multiplied by the rate. So we're solving for x. x is our unknown initial amount. And I say, if you add these two terms together, the initial plus the initial times the rate, so x times 0.03, that's 1.03 times x. Solve for x, and you should get 15, 18, 24 dirhams. Yeah. Uh, good, good question. The 1 just comes from here, 1x plus 0.03x. And so the 1 is the principal amount, which, which I'm calling the, the initial. Um, at the, the way to think of it is at the end of the year, this, this amount, this 1563, has two parts. It has the initial amount that was deposited, and then it has the interest that accumulated. And so x is the initial deposit amount, and then this second term is the interest amount that accumulated. All right. OK, so we've gone over the first three problems. What I'd like you to do now is, without ever seeing a cash flow diagram before, I'm asking you to go out on a limb, be creative, and come up with some sort of a visual representation for uh, how to summarize the problem that's described in step four. And once you've done that sketch, flip over the page, and you can use your phone to solve problem five. You're going to need uh, access to the internet. I'm asking you to look up a few interest rates just so you get a feel for the magnitude of a credit card interest rate versus a savings account interest rate, and so on. So do the sketch, then start on part five. Here's the little sketch that I put together. Why do you suppose I have one line going up and then the other line's going down? What could be a possible interpretation of that? OK, yeah, up is when you're uh, receiving money. Down is when you're outflow. So inflow versus outflow. That's right. Um, and then you'll notice that these lines are the same length, roughly. Uh, of course, the interp interpretation of that is that the amounts are the same. And I guess if I was being a little more precise, I should have made this line longer than the others. Because, you know, 10,000, it should be a longer line than 3,300. And of course, I'm not going to get too picky when you do this sort of thing on homework or exams. But, you know, it's better for it to be approximately to scale, you know, longer for greater amounts and so on. So, I mean, that's, that's our first stab at cash flow diagrams. Now, on the back side of the paper here, the first thing is if you have money to save at Everbank, what amount did you find? Anybody looked that up? 1.11%. And they're bragging about it, is the irony. Is they are so proud of the 1.11% that they're paying. Uh, here it is, 1.11%, one year intro APY. After a year, it's almost certainly going to go down. Right now, this is the highest interest rate in the country that you can get on a money market or savings account. So it's pretty terrible. I remember um, back in 2008, the year before I came to Marshall, I had a savings account that was paying 5.6%. That was a nice savings account. Um, but because of the economic recession, interest rates went down because the demand for money went down among businesses. The central banks were paying less interest and so on. So for a variety of reasons, when you are giving money to the bank, they don't want to pay you very much. But when you're paying money to the bank, of course, they still want a lot there. And so let's look at the mortgage rates. Um, all right. So here is uh, the interest rate and the APR. We'll talk about what the difference between the rate and the APR. We'll go into a lot of details on that late, uh, later. But the, um, the short answer is it has to do with the effect of compounding when you pay interest on top of interest. 
That's why the APR is higher. So here it has a 15 year, it looks like 3.05 approximately. For their 20 year, they want 3.33, and the 30 year, 3.591. Actually, that's a different web page than I found earlier when I was searching. So hopefully the rates are the same regardless of what part of their website you're looking on. How would you explain the trend? First of all, what is the trend? The interest rate is increasing the longer you're borrowing the money from the bank. Why do you suppose that is? Why do you think the bank wants you to pay more if you borrow the money over 30 years compared to borrowing the money over 15 years? What was it? Smaller payment. Okay. The value of the dollar is going down, right? Right. So he, he mentioned the risk. You know, the, lo the longer the loan, I guess, the more risky it is for the bank. For a lot of reasons. You may not repay the money. Uh, the economy may change. And so that if there's a lot of inflation, you're paying back the bank with money that isn't worth as much. Did you have another comment? Right. That's right. So at the end of your 30-year mortgage, uh, your payments are going to seem just so tiny by comparison to how they felt at the beginning of your mortgage. Not only because you'll probably be making more at the end of a 30-year mortgage, but also just the value of money has changed. Excellent. What about auto loans? How do auto loans compare to house loans? Let's look it up. First of all, you'll notice it's changing based on the model year of the car, which I think is a little bit interesting. The trend there, I think, is that uh, the interest rate goes up a little bit for older cars because it's more risky for them the longer the loan. And um, newer cars are, I guess, going to hold their value better because a loan like this is secured against the value of the vehicle. So again, these differences in interest rate. I asked you to look at the uh, 2012 car. If it's 54 months, what I, I just did some uh, rough calculations here, and I said for, for 54 months, if it's a 2012 model year, it was probably actually built in 2011, because that's a game that the automakers play to try and make people feel like they've got like an even newer car, as they're releasing it a year in advance. So it could have been built in the middle of 2011. So at the end of 54 months, that's four and a half years, and if you started that loan today, we're already most of the way through 2016, eight twelfths of the way. So it could actually be, the car could be 10 years old by the time you stop paying it off. So why does that matter? Any idea why I asked you to think along those lines? Yeah, some cars don't last 10 years. I mean, they last longer than they used to, but you have to be careful because you could be paying off a loan for a vehicle that is in the junkyard, and that would be an unpleasant loan to pay for sure. Has anybody found the, uh, the Chase United Mileage Plus Visa credit card? Anybody found that yet? What interest rate did you find? 16%. Variable, yeah, let's go look at that. So it was, if we just do the Google search for uh, Chase United Mileage Plus Visa card, here is the main United, oh, that's the wrong one. Uh, where was I looking? Here. All right, under pricing and terms. Boy, that really is small print, isn't it? It's like the last place you could possibly look on the page. There's a reason why they made it super small print at the bottom and far on the right. It's because they don't want you to look. Right? But if you do look, you're going to get some unpleasant news about your credit card. 16.24%. Um, and the way they calculate that is that they add, with a little asterisk here, A, that is they add 12.74% to the prime rate. The prime rate is just kind of like uh, it's what banks charge each other for short-term loans. And so they want... They're going to get the money that they give you to purchase your things from some other bank or from the government, and then they want 12.7% on top of it from you. So 
Long story short, credit cards are very dangerous. You have to be careful with them. All right, so as we come to a close, let's take one last look at these announcements. Homework one is due by 5 o'clock today. You can submit that assignment on MU Online. Homework two, I've handed out the paper to you. You can get started on that based on what we've discussed today. That's due a week from today. So I'll see you on Friday. Have a good one.